I wonder if maybe we can start by you just diving a little bit into the work that you do and uh, how you got started in, uh, in your field. I actually work in, with Headlands Research. It's um, actually several offices around the United States, including in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And we work in where our department in particular is narrow and we work with Alzheimer's, any forms of dementia. We also do Parkinson's, a lot of neuro um, disorders and aging. So our research is put together. We collect data for the pharmaceutical companies, but we're also providing some of those advantages that from the, these pharmaceutical companies to people who can't afford these medications. So that's one of the reasons, the main reasons why I got into it. Uh, there's many medications out on the current market. And when I say they're really expensive in Alzheimer's research, I could say some of them might cost about $35,000 per infusion um, just to remove plaque in the brain. So the average person or anyone on Medicare, a retired elderly person won't be able to afford this. And this is what's beauty about research. So sometimes, you know, they may or may not receive the medication, whether they're in a placebo or a controlled environment, but it's a chance to maintaining this disease, this progressive disease, at the same time giving them a chance, hope that they didn't have before. So there's where my passion is. And um, I look forward to getting more involved in clinical research and actually branching in psychology more into research. Um, it's difficult working in different areas in psychology. And I feel like as this you know, program is growing, there is limited sources, governmental, people who deal with insurances. However, this is a branch of psychology that, psychology that should grow. It's amazing, especially when you have a passion for it and saying, hey, as psychologists, we can do this too. You know, we have the knowledge and especially branching neuro and mental health together. It's been a big pleasure and a passion of mine. Well, we are living in a time where people are asking for more connections, more bridges. They understand that um, well-being is more than just a medical model. It's it's more than just a psychological model in itself. And that um, I, I, at least from what I understand, you seem to be one of those bridging um, persons that that really is interested in uh, finding a way to link those. Um, can I ask, what is, what is your background in psychology? Background in psychology is general um, clinical psychology with a concentration in neuropsychology. So, I've had serious different backgrounds. I graduated from Carlos Albizu University in Miami, Florida, and then I branched out in several settings. So I've worked in the VA settings, I've worked with social security disability evaluations, worked in hospital settings and rehab settings. So I have a, and private practice. I have a little bit of everything in the field, which is great, and also the research aspect to it. Um, you're right, I do wanna be one of those, <laughs> people who's creating a bridge um, to this world. Um, traditionally, you know, psychology really was psychiatrists <laughs> until we branched out to psychologists and then mental health therapists and you have licensed social workers working in the field. So we've branched out a lot, but there's still that disconnect between the medical and psychology. And I'm trying to be one of those bridges. So, and I look forward to seeing where it will take me. And with, in regards to you know, my other professional background, it's trying to make a, a difference to the community, to people who can't re receive these resources that it's lacking. So that I try to look for different career paths that will help me provide resources to people who don't have access to it. Maybe you can tap into that, uh, just that, that little feature of what you shared of what it feels like to you when you experience the possibility of making a difference in someone else's life? It's actually a powerful feeling. Um, just sometimes being that light in the most darkest room, whether it's giving hope, whether it's helping a hand, whether it's providing resources, seeing that change in a client's face or a patient face, it's, it's, 
it's making their whole world like giving them something that they didn't have yesterday or even minutes before seeing you. So making those small connections with people and realizing that everyone is unique and everyone deserves a chance or even the opportunity, then it makes that difference every day. I live and work for, I look forward to that. Even if there's people who do have the advantage, but sometimes they might be missing out on something that they didn't have before. So those little small connections I like to make and every day I do my best to make a difference in someone's life. It could be something as small as like, hey, I'll provide you this link to something as, hey, I'm, um, you know, did you know about this opportunity that can provide the medicine you may need? So it's these different avenues that can help people get to where they are. Most people don't listen to them. So me being there to even just listening sometimes can make that huge difference. And that's that's what I work for. I That's how I can make an impact. I might not be someone who in the medical field who's like, you know, saving lives, being a surgeon or anything like that day to day, but um, it's that emotional and mental aspect that people also need saving. And that's what I live for. One of the things I've learned coming to Meridian at first, it was, you know, what is transformative learning? And then it's like, oh, but I technically do this on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> because I feel um, people learn from each other's experiences, people learn vicariously, people learn um, through different behaviors and how they react to the world. It's more than just reading a book and just not applying. You need to read that book and apply it, um, observe and learn from each other. That's one of the things I honestly love about Meridian. It's that connection that even though it's an online, I feel like working with my students and having more of a dialogue style um, classroom, engaging them with questions that happens on things that happen beyond the books. There's things we can learn from the books and the readings. I'm not here to regurgitate lectures. I'm here to like probe and expand their own horizons, and give them cases, case studies, how, and then have them try to conceptualize. And when they have questions or doubt, encourage them to share that with the class in an open setting so that everyone can learn from each other. And I've noticed with my students, you know, the compliments I get from them, they're very supportive. They're, they're amazing. You know, how they do like that style of teaching. They do like how um, I sometimes will push their limits almost because I want them to think outside the box. I want them to be better than me out in the field. <laughs> I want them to grow and see that Yes, certain things we've learned in psychology and in the books sometimes does not apply outside in the real world. And exposing them to parts of the different real world or things that you learn outside when you're not learning in school is going to make them open their eyes to those different pathways like you spoke of, you know, that one little change and the shift can take them to different areas. Um, I honestly thought I was just going to stay only in research and I branched out to so many different areas of psychology that it gave me that knowledge and it made me strive to do better and become a better person. And me coming from a background of nothing, <laughs> you know, I'm okay with these choices, but I want everyone to live more in a humanistic approach to life and empathic and share this quality that they don't want to get to experience it just being in a typical classroom and just reading the books and taking a test. It's more of that engagement. And I think that engagement is more powerful to their learning and to their growth. But you're pointing towards the importance of the dialogue in the classroom, that the engagement itself is part of the learning process within the students. It's funny you said that because I had a student today who emailed me. He's like, I'm, oh, I found out I'm having you again in art my class. I can't wait to see you in 30 minutes. I'm like, this is the first week. Remember, I'll see you next week. But I'm so excited that I saw you on my roster. <laughs> so it's good to see that feedback. That like, they will communicate when the semesters begin. Um, I've had students that have already had me like going into my fourth semester, three or four classes already. Um, it's it's a good, powerful feeling that I'm 
touching them in, in, in a way where they want to come back. They look forward to my Zoom sessions and they try to be there. And if not, they will ask away during my observation section. I use that as a tool for me to communicate them and make them feel part of the class, even if they cannot be there for the Zoom sessions. So the fact that they feel that and that they feel seen in, in an online world, it it's 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 encouraging for me to stay. I, I love that about it because I know they're getting something from it and they're going to grow from that. What is uh, what is what is your source of hope for the future? My hope in the future is that as as long as much as this society grows and consistently changes, that psychology will continue to change and grow with the changing of times. Um, and it has grown so much, even within the last 20 years, but there's always room for growth. And, you know, our students, I want them to be that forefront of change and to, you know, take even the smallest things I've taught them and be able to apply it and pass on the knowledge and grow and be as flexible with society and life in general as possible and take things that come and go and just be okay with it. There's change and that's okay. You know, how do we grow with that change? Um, that's the flexibility and hope that I aspire for, for not only myself, but for the people I teach. Um, that's something that's always been special to me because it's almost, those are my footprints that I leave behind. And one day I won't be here but I know that's something I shared. Yeah. How do you feel about this possibility that our actions and our thoughts and our feelings and our interactions can have ripple effects that start with you and then they move out and sort of, in some sense, almost make it around the globe. Do you believe that's possible? I do, um, even through my personal experiences through my own life. Um, the the psych my school psychologist when I was in elementary school saying that, you know, she's just bored. We need to give her more work <laughs> to the person who I looked up to and I still think of Dr. Maraca to this day. And that's something from fourth grade. I felt like she somehow just inspired me to you know, help others. And when there's time to do it, always pass it forward. And then to like a car accident that changed my whole life when I was a teenager. And that's how I even got into neurology or like neuroscience and neuropsych. So it's these like small changes that created this ripple effect to where I am today. And I do believe in that. I feel like things happen for a reason. And sometimes we are put in a path that we should just go with. If, if you're meant to be in that particular path, whether it's a few years, a few months, a few weeks, maybe you're there for a reason. So on a personal and spiritual level, I feel like we are where we're supposed to be. And it's for a reason. And if we don't know that reason, we should explore why. What is the most rewarding aspect of being a teacher? Um, one thing I do learned and my whole life was, you know, my I had found my mom would be like, well, it's just power. And this is how you're going to strive in this world to my stepdad, who was Arab. So education was very important to him. <laughs> but they they did teach me together in an essence that, yeah, it is more than power, but we've gained and we can see things that other people can't see. And if you go back to Plato, uh, if the allegory of the cave, sometimes, you know, living in ignorance, it's, it's bliss, but sometimes passing in that knowledge and bringing in that light and showing them a different world that they can strive more than what other people have been able to, to suspect. I've, when I worked with autism, I've had so many doctors, other therapists say, well, this is his limitation. So we're just going to leave it as that. No, and I would fight against it. I'm like, no, we don't know that. Maybe he is nonverbal and can do certain things, but I can teach him basic skills to the point where families will come to me. He's like, oh my God, he wants to pack. And, you know, I used his strengths 
to improve basic skills where eventually I could see him working in a, in a factory packing packages. Might be nonverbal, might need some supervision and monitoring, but that wasn't his limit. His limitation was like, no, he can just sit there and do, you know, remedial stuff where he just has to sit and calm him down, might have to be put in a group home. That was their limitation. No one thought about that. And that's the power of education. That's the power of teaching because it's more than that. I believe that I have a certain knowledge and I want to share that knowledge because I don't know how is it going to impact to someone else. So I want, and I don't know what their limitation is. They need to determine that it's their path, their journey. And to get there, we won't know unless we share that knowledge. I'm curious if you can speak to your own growing edges where you see yourself developing into the future. What are greater bridges that you are still wanting to build? The things that I'm working on is trying to put more of a balance into my personal life in the sense where I do have a great husband, but I do work and I love to work a lot. <laughs> So it's making, you know, making time and creating that work balance for myself, even though my job gives that to me. And I feel like even teaching and reading, I can do that. Um, but I always feel like I want to do something more. So it's sometimes just slowing down the brakes and enjoying my own accomplishments, but it's at the same time, enjoying the moment, being here in the now. Um, it's funny how I'm teaching this stuff in classes but at the same time applying that to myself it's taking that step further and saying yes this is the knowledge this is what it is but i i can't i i have to work on myself as well we all have to work on ourselves none of us are perfect and i do enjoy that balance and i feel like my husband is the yin and the yang <laughs> between our relationship because he can help create that balance and i feel very blessed and lucky to have that but, and I know it's a struggle for other people. So it's just finding what's good for you, what's good for you mentally, physically, financially, and trying to work through those barriers. So as I still develop myself, I do have this imprint of what I want in the next few years, but reminding myself that even if I can't make certain goals, it's still okay. Light, that's what life is all about. So just, Holding the brakes sometimes is what I'm really working on. I want to want to leave something behind, but I also want to feel that I'm enjoying it, life at, as, as well. It, life is an adventure, and I don't want to miss out on that. I'm curious, what is it that you are sensing that the world needs most in this moment? And how can teachers or guides offer something in that direction? Actually, the first thing that came to mind when you were talking about that was my, my neighbor has a rental home, right? So he rents it out. And we he just had a, a family and an older couple. So I guess they do this, they're from Canada, they come every year. And I just found it how beautiful. Every time I came back from work, walking the dog they all like like all four of them it was like two couples they would just literally sit by the pool and face where the sun was setting every single day they never missed it and i t i spoke to them about it and i and i was like i find that amusing i don't see that anymore <laughs> like the, everyone's so glued to social media and you know the phones and how could they just take make that effort to make that small moment to see every single sunset and i thought that was beautiful because i think it's the small things we need to find in life to deal with the chaos and i think people get lost into the chaos get lost into you know being disconnected that you will miss out on sunsets like seeing them made me realize hey vanessa you came back to florida because you missed the sunsets. You miss the beautiful skies and the different colors. We have pinks and blues and purple. It's like seeing a rainbow, like during the day. It's just the changes of light. And I got 
into work and doing this and you know oh, let's catch up on this oh there's a show on tv that i forgot one of the reasons why i missed florida and seeing them taking up that appreciation every day few and five minutes before glass of wine let's see the perfect sunset that is what we all need we need to find our own sunset what's going to make us stop from the chaos and ground ourselves and when you find that peace i think you can get through the chaos no matter how bad it could be